What happens when a tremor that the world might dismiss as moderate becomes a nation's nightmare? How can a quake of magnitude 6, a size that modern cities in other regions often withstand, level entire Afghan villages in seconds? Late on August 31st, eastern Afghanistan found the answers in the worst possible way. The earth heaved violently beneath the fertile valleys of Nangahar and Kunar, and what unfolded was not just shaking ground, but a chain of failures, fragile homes collapsing, families trapped in darkness, and communities cut off by landslides. This disaster was not only a matter of seismic force, but also of where and how that force struck, exposing the dangerous fault lines beneath the Hindu Kush and the vulnerabilities built upon them. The tremor struck at 11.47 p.m. local time, its epicenter located about 27 kilometers east-northeast of Jalalabad, one of Afghanistan's most populous cities, with roughly 300,000 residents. Its shallow depth of only about 8 kilometers meant that seismic energy was released alarmingly close to the surface. Within seconds, violent shaking coursed through fertile valleys built on alluvial soil, where seismic waves amplified and intensified. In many communities across Nangahar and Kunar provinces, the shaking reached a violent rating on the modified Mercalli intensity scale, equivalent to MMI-9, causing nearly every building in some districts to collapse. The human toll was immediate and severe. Early counts placed fatalities at around 800, but seasoned observers quickly noted that such figures were likely a gross underestimate. In some villages, survivors reported that nearly every household had lost at least one member. One settlement, Wadir, may have reached 800 deaths alone. With rescue operations hampered by blocked mountain roads, damaged bridges and continuing aftershocks, the true scale of destruction will only emerge with time. Many independent estimates place the eventual toll in the range of two to 3,000 dead, with many thousands more injured and tens of thousands left homeless. The quake could not have struck under worse circumstances. Its occurrence in the middle of the night trapped residents in their beds, unable to flee collapsing structures. Most of the housing stock in eastern Afghanistan consists of unreinforced masonry, sun-dried mud or simple brick, which cannot withstand strong shaking. Multi-story concrete blocks in Jalalabad and Asadabad were not much safer, as they often lack the seismic reinforcement common in earthquake-prone countries with stronger building codes. With nearly every factor stacked against survival, nighttime timing, shallow depth, weak structures, proximity to a dense urban population, and soil amplification, the event rapidly escalated into one of Afghanistan's most lethal natural disasters in decades. Seismologists examining the event have confirmed that it was the product of thrust faulting, a result of the immense compressional forces exerted as the Indian tectonic plate grinds northward into Eurasia at about five centimetres per year. This colossal collision is the same geological process responsible for thrusting up the Himalayas and sustaining the jagged Hindu Kush mountains that dominate eastern Afghanistan. The earthquake's rupture likely occurred along a segment of a thrust fault system near the Konar Valley, with an estimated rupture length of more than 8 kilometers. No clear surface break was observed, indicating the slip occurred below ground, but the resulting strain release was enough to trigger landslides in steeper terrain and liquefaction in the saturated soils of valley farmlands. The scale of damage was further magnified by a phenomenon well understood but rarely appreciated outside seismology. Seismic amplification. Much of the region's population resides along river valleys, where millennia of sediment deposits form thick layers of soft soil. When seismic waves travel from bedrock into these sediments, they slow down but increase in amplitude, causing stronger shaking at the surface. Thus, while outcrops of solid rock may have experienced severe shaking at MMI-8, valley towns built on sediments were subjected to violent MMI-9 shaking. It is in these very valleys that most of the collapsed villages lie. Aftershocks quickly followed the main event. Within the first 24 hours, at least four significant aftershocks were recorded, including two of magnitude 5 and two of magnitude 4. One of the magnitude 5 shocks was shallow and destructive enough to act like a second earthquake. 
toppling structures that had been weakened but not destroyed in the main event. Each tremor sowed new panic among survivors and complicated rescue operations, as already cracked walls gave way and landslides sealed off access roads again and again. The international community responded with urgency, but Afghanistan's terrain and security situation slowed the deployment of aid. Helicopters ferried supplies from Jalalabad toward remote villages, while convoys carrying medical teams and emergency relief often found themselves blocked by landslides. Reporters reaching the scene described entire towns erased, with villagers digging by hand through rubble to reach family members. Dust clouds rose each evening as survivors shifted bricks and beams, their search illuminated only by flashlights and the glow of small fires. Beyond the immediate human tragedy, the quake raises pressing scientific and safety questions. Why was such a moderate-sized earthquake able to produce devastation on this scale? And what does it reveal about the dangerous fault systems that crisscross Afghanistan's eastern provinces? The answer lies not only in the local geology, but in the broader tectonic architecture of South Asia. Afghanistan sits at the western edge of the ongoing collision between the Indian and Eurasian plates, one of the most dramatic and destructive tectonic encounters on Earth. The relentless northward push of India into Asia is responsible for a wide network of thrust and strike slip faults across Afghanistan, Pakistan and northern India. Among the most notorious are the Charman fault system in southern Afghanistan, capable of producing magnitude 7-plus quakes, and the central Badakhshan fault in the north. In the east, near the Hindu Kush, thrust fault systems accommodate much of the compressional stress. Historically, these structures have produced some of the region's deadliest earthquakes. In 1935, a magnitude 7.7 .7 quake linked to the Charman Fault struck near Quetta, killing around 35,000 people. In June 1978, a magnitude 6.5 shallow earthquake near the Afghanistan-Pakistan border flattened entire villages, eerily similar in scale to the 2025 event. In 2002, a magnitude 6.1 thrust quake destroyed multiple towns in the same general area as the current disaster, killing over 1,000. Across the border in Pakistan, the 2005 Kashmir earthquake, magnitude 7.6, caused nearly 75,000 deaths, while in 2015, Nepal suffered more than 8,000 fatalities from a magnitude 7.8 quake. Even deep earthquakes, while less destructive locally, highlight the volatility of the region. In 2015, a magnitude 7.5 event at a depth of more than 200 kilometers still killed 115 people in Jalalabad, despite its depth diminishing much of its surface impact. Shallower quakes, like the 2025 event, unleash their energy dangerously close to populations that are among the most vulnerable on the planet. This pattern underscores a grim truth. Eastern Afghanistan is perched on a seismic powder keg. The India-Eurasia collision continues unabated, adding strain year by year. Faults capable of producing events much larger than magnitude 6 crisscross the landscape, and history shows they rupture with devastating consequences. Scientists warn that while this latest quake was lethal, it was far from the maximum the region can produce. A repeat of a magnitude 7-plus event along one of the region's major thrusts is not a matter of if... But when? The August 31st quake is a reminder of that inevitability. Its devastation was magnified by the vulnerabilities of Afghanistan's housing, infrastructure and geography, but the root cause lies in tectonics far older and more powerful than any nation. Each thrust fault hidden beneath the Hindu Kush is a locked spring, straining under continental collision, waiting to snap. The disaster has now forced international experts to once again study these dangerous structures in detail, asking not only what failed on that night in late August, but what else might be primed to rupture in the years ahead. The August 31st earthquake was not an isolated rupture, but part of a wider tectonic dialogue written across the Hindu Kush. When a thrust fault segment slipped beneath Nangarhar, it did more than release energy. It altered the distribution of stress across neighbouring structures. In regions where multiple faults cluster, one rupture can load another, priming it for future activity. This phenomenon, 
known as stress transfer, has been observed worldwide, from Turkey's North Anatolian Fault to California's San Andreas system. In Afghanistan, where active thrusts and strike-slip faults intertwine, the implications are profound. The Konar Valley rupture likely transferred compressional stress northwestward into the complex fault systems of the Hindu Kush, where steeply dipping thrusts and strike-slip planes converge. These zones are historically unstable, and even small adjustments in stress can bring an already strained section closer to failure. Remote sensing experts are now turning to satellite-based INSAR to measure subtle ground deformation across eastern Afghanistan, seeking to identify which nearby segments may have been nudged toward instability. Early data suggest localized uplift in ridgelines north of Jalalabad, a hint that stress has shifted upward into adjoining fault blocks. What makes this especially concerning is the region's history of earthquake clustering. In 1978, a shallow magnitude 6.5 event in the same general corridor was followed within months by additional shocks further north. Similarly, after the magnitude 6.1 quake in 2002, seismicity migrated along the arc of thrust faults for nearly a year. The Hindu Kush is therefore not just a landscape of isolated quakes, but a system where one event often heralds another. The August 31st rupture may fit into this pattern, raising the possibility that aftershocks and secondary quakes could persist for months or years, some of them large enough to cause new disasters. The geology beneath eastern Afghanistan only heightens these risks. Unlike strike-slip zones, which often release strain along single, relatively well-defined breaks, compressional regimes like the Hindu Kush distribute stress across multiple overlapping structures. Seismologists refer to this as fault segmentation. Each segment may appear dormant for decades, but strain continues to build invisibly until it is suddenly released. When the Indian plate presses inexorably northward, energy does not dissipate evenly. It accumulates in concentrated zones of weakness. Some of these zones have already revealed themselves through catastrophic ruptures, while others remain locked, waiting for the right trigger. Among these, the Shaman Fault, further south, looms as a major concern. Stretching more than 800 kilometers, it marks a boundary where India grinds past Eurasia laterally. Although primarily strike-slip, its northern reaches interact with thrust systems, making it sensitive to stress changes from quakes in eastern Afghanistan. The last century has not seen a full rupture of its northern section, leading many scientists to suspect that strain is silently accumulating. If the August 31st quake redistributed stress in that direction, it could hasten the timeline for a larger Charman rupture. Another fault of interest lies to the northeast, the central Badakhshan system. While less famous, it cuts through remote mountainous terrain and is capable of producing magnitude 7-plus earthquakes. Its sparse population may suggest limited risk, but its proximity to cross-border hydropower projects and transnational roads means that even a localized event could ripple into regional crises. With the August quake altering stress fields, the Badakhshan faults are being watched closely for subtle signs of renewed strain. The complexity deepens when one considers the interplay of shallow and deep earthquakes in the Hindu Kush. This region is famous for unusually deep seismicity with events occurring more than 200 kilometers below the surface. These quakes, linked to the steep subduction and foundering of the Indian slab beneath Eurasia, generally cause limited surface damage. Yet they play a hidden role. By shifting stress within the subducted plate, they can indirectly affect the loading of shallower faults. The August event, while shallow, occurred within this larger three-dimensional puzzle where forces at depth constantly reshape conditions nearer the surface. It is this multi-layered tectonic architecture that makes Afghanistan one of the most seismically unpredictable regions on Earth. The cascading effects are not merely theoretical. Field reports have already documented secondary landslides in valleys north of the epicenter, suggesting that slopes destabilized by the main quake remain precarious. In some cases, cracks running for hundreds of metres along ridgelines point to creeping ground movement, a prelude to larger slope failures that could be triggered by aftershocks or seasonal rainfall. 
Such geomorphic responses are an extension of the earthquake itself, as the redistribution of stress does not stop with the rupture plane, but continues to work through the landscape for years. For communities, this means the August 31st disaster may not be a single event, but the opening act of a longer seismic episode. Scientists are now modelling possible rupture scenarios across the eastern fault network, estimating how much strain remains stored and where it is most likely to release. One troubling outcome is the potential for a magnitude 7 or larger event if a longer fault segment were to rupture in a cascading failure. Unlike the 8-kilometre rupture length estimated for the August quake, such an event could involve 40 kilometres or more of fault plane, releasing exponentially greater energy. The broader tectonic context offers no comfort. India continues to advance into Eurasia at 5 centimetres per year, a rate geologically rapid and unrelenting. Over centuries, that motion has built the tallest mountains in the world, but it also guarantees a near-constant cycle of earthquakes. In Afghanistan, where infrastructure is fragile and preparedness limited, each rupture carries consequences far beyond its moment of shaking. Every collapsed home, every severed road, every buried irrigation canal is a reminder that geology dictates daily survival in ways both dramatic and subtle. The August 31st quake has therefore forced a dual reckoning, one humanitarian as survivors struggle to rebuild and one scientific as experts dissect the event for clues about what comes next. The lessons are sobering. Moderate magnitude earthquakes in compressional settings can be lethally amplified by shallow depths and vulnerable construction. Fault networks in eastern Afghanistan are interconnected, meaning one rupture rarely ends the story. And the relentless collision of India into Eurasia ensures that this seismic cycle will not abate for generations. If there is one message from the ground beneath Nangaha, it is that earthquakes in this region cannot be treated as isolated accidents. They are the surface expression of a tectonic struggle that will continue as long as continents move. The question is not whether another major rupture will occur, but where, when and how prepared communities will be when it does. To imagine the danger, picture a map of eastern Afghanistan traced with invisible scars. To the south, the Chaman Fault runs like a jagged seam, extending hundreds of kilometres into Pakistan its strands capable of tearing in magnitude 7 or greater shocks. To the northeast, the central Badakhshan fault winds through remote mountains, storing strain that could rupture suddenly with destructive reach. Cutting across the Hindu Kush itself are thrust belts like those near the Konar Valley, where the August 31st quake struck, each segment a compressed spring coiled beneath the mountains. And far below, the subducted Indian plate sinks into the mantle, spawning deep earthquakes that jolt cities like Jalalabad, even when no surface rupture occurs. This layered fault architecture means stress is never confined. It migrates, leaps and builds, creating a seismic chessboard on which every move reshapes the next. The science of this disaster is still unfolding, but the stakes are clear. Monitoring, mapping and understanding Afghanistan's seismic landscape is not an academic exercise. It is a matter of survival for millions who live in the shadow of the Hindu Kush. Like, share and subscribe to stay updated as we continue to investigate the hidden forces shaping some of the world's most dangerous landscapes.